Maybe Joanna, you sit first. Sorry? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you sit there. How's the poll going to work? Okay. Is it working, Hannah? Okay, great. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to Imperial College and to our event on climate litigation. Um, what we're going to do is we're gonna kick off, um, there's quite a few people in the room, but there's lots of people online as well. So bear that in mind when people are asking questions, they might not be here and we'll be repeating them um, out loud so you can hear. Um, before we kick off, we're gonna do a very quick poll on Mentimeter to get a feel for the knowledge of everybody in this conversation about climate litigation. So if you can use, go to the menti.com site on your computer or phone um, or scan that in. I don't know how well that works from wherever you're sitting. Um, and if you can quickly answer the three questions that we have there, we'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. And then we're gonna show the results on the screen. So hopefully everyone online is also doing what everyone in the room is doing, uh -huh. which is quickly typing some thoughts on climate litigation into their phone or computer. People are still typing, that's why I'm not doing anything yet. Okay, so now we've got on the screen here, hopefully you can see that online, how much people know about climate litigation. Is this? Oh, that's not the poll they filled in, Hannah. Ah, uh, there we go. So I'm gonna just get up and stand up a little bit so that I can see this. Um, so what, do, what, what, what comes up when people think of climate litigation? What words come to mind? So we've got quite big, a lot of people see responsibility, justice, accountability, important human rights, and then a little bit smaller, um, scientists will be pleased to see attribution, attribution, science, biodiversity impacts. Um, there's something there about evidence, difficulty, um, quite a few difficult, but also essential. And lawyers is up there too, maybe essential lawyers. So that's also positive for people on the panel. Um, so lots of really interesting ideas there and we look forward to exploring them with you all now, um, particularly this junction between where we've got science and law. So that's what we're hoping to cover. Um, Hannah, do we have, did, were people able to put input on the other questions? We could do it at the end, okay. Okay, great. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, now, um, what we're gonna do to start, um, it's my pleasure, I'm not gonna introduce the whole panel now, so you can hold out, um, find out who those people are in a second. Um, but Joanna Setzer, Dr. Joanna Setzer, who's standing he sitting here, um, works at the Grantham LSE, so the Grantham Research Center at LSE, and she's in charge of their work on climate change laws of the world and litigation. She's a very preeminent expert on climate and litigation, and she's gonna just kick off now with two minutes introduction to what climate litigation is so that everyone starts from at least the same base point. So I'm gonna hand over to you first, Joanna, and then we'll go back um, and welcome the entire panel. Joanna. Thank you so much. You see, climate litigation in two minutes. Let's see. Well, I decided to give you three points. I can, I'll have to be very quick. The first is definition, because it is important to understand what we are, what we mean by climate litigation. And the answer is that there are many definitions. And by defining in one way means that you're excluding the others. We 
when we gather data and we, when we analyze the cases, we tend to take a narrow definition. And the narrow definition is basically that we're looking at cases that explicitly consider climate in the case. By doing that, we're excluding a bunch of cases that are important for climate. And I think this is important in this conversation because the science is not really bothered by if the word climate being in the case or not. It's more worried about climate being affected or addressed. So in the definition of climate litigation, unfortunately, this is usually excluded. Cases that deal with emissions but don't have a discussion on climate change are excluded. And this is something to keep in mind. When we talk about numbers of climate litigation cases, we're looking at the narrow approach. OK, I said numbers of cases. How many cases do we have? We have, uh, together with the Sabin Center, the Grantham uh, and the Sabin have collected everything that we consider fits in this narrow approach. And we know that there are more than 2,100 cases that explicitly have a discussion on climate. Uh, within the case, and these are judicial and quasi-judicial cases. This, this number has increased significantly, especially since 2015. It used to be very much in the US. It has gone now to almost uh, every region in the, well, every region in many countries in the world, 43 countries and 15 international courts. The last point, I'm sticking to two minutes, is that this body of cases is quite heterogeneous, but we tend to be more interested in a smaller group, which we try to classify. Again, it's a subjective classification, but we try to understand what is strategic litigation. Litigation that is not just concerned with the individual, uh, the motives of one individual claimant, but is trying to bring a broader societal change. And this means trying to make governments to do more or to enforce what they've promised to do or try to change corporate behavior. This group of cases strategic, that we call strategic litigation, it's uh, also growing. And we, we do this type of assessment where we see how much uh, it's growing. Uh, two final points. One is that strategic litigation can come in all directions. You can have strategic litigation to challenge climate action. So something to keep in mind. Not all litigation is promoting climate action. And the last and final point, which ties back to the science, is that the last IPCC assessment report six of working group three recognized that climate litigation has an impact in the outcomes of climate governance. So uh, this is the first time that a summary for policymakers also recognizes that climate litigation is one of the many tools of uh, addressing this problem. And uh, I stop there hopefully within my two minutes. Okay, that was brilliant. Thanks, um, Joanna. So lots of really interesting pieces there. So if your ears pricked up, um, be ready to ask questions or guide the conversation in that direction. I'm now going to introduce the rest of the panel. Um, and then I'm going to ask them all a couple of questions before opening the conversation out to all of you um, in the audience as well. So to my right, um, we have Mark Willers, um, who's a King's Counsel. It's kind of cool that we had to say that now. Um, <laughs> um, and he's a barrister who's worked on lots of different areas of law, but particularly has very large environmental law practice um, and has been involved in some very public cases on, in this area of climate litigation. Um, to my left, I have Freddie Otto, who is a physicist working here and who's done extensive work on climate attribution, which is one of the areas of evidence that's really important to climate litigation. Um, also have Dr. Yuri Rogel, again, works here at the Center for Environmental Policy, also the Grantham Institute Director of Research, and has very been an expert witness, I believe, on some of these cases. Um, and then at the end, um, we have another um, barrister, um, Margarita Cornelia, who specializes in climate change and human rights cases as well. So quite a variety of perspectives across the panel. So I'm going to start by asking the panel to say a little bit about the role of evidence, and particularly scientific evidence, in climate litigation. What's important, or what's difficult, um, or, or what you, you think is needed in that area. Um, I'm going to start with Mark, and we'll come back to you at the end, Joanna, since we've heard a bit from you in laying out the land. Mark. Sure. Uh, my experience of uh, climate change cases is primarily in the uh, arena where we're challenging um, either decisions taken by uh, public decision makers as to whether or not to grant planning permission, for example, for a development which has an impact on the climate, or, or alternatively challenging um, the government uh, 
on its policy uh, or failure to uh, tackle climate change uh, because it's failed to adopt the appropriate policy which will reduce as we need to in, in accordance with the IPCC reports uh, dramatically uh, the emissions uh, arising from um, uh, private and public actors. And, and in those cases, the scientific evidence that we rely upon is primarily that incontrovertible evidence, um, which um, is accepted uh, throughout the world by 196 countries, uh, arising from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, reports. And so um, it is a crucial element of the uh, case that we advance in the uh, public arena in judicial review cases, but it's pretty much accepted evidence. And so it, it's crucial, but there's little that the government or indeed um, private developers can do to challenge it. Um, that's fantastic from the point of view of a lawyer uh, representing somebody challenging the, that, the, the inadequacy of policy or a decision on, on grounds that it doesn't take account of uh, the dangerous impact that climate change has on uh, the public and biodiversity. Um, the difficulty will, uh, arises, I think, in cases brought against um, uh, private companies, fossil fuel companies, uh, in circumstances where an individual or perhaps a, a municipality, a local authority, uh, wishes to sue that uh, uh, fossil fuel company or, or, or cement uh, uh, company for the uh, global emissions or its contribution to the global emissions that gives rise to dangerous climate change. And that's where the attribution science um, that uh, Freddie and Jury will, will, will talk about um, is going to be so important. And at the moment, um, I think there's a disconnect between the massive advances that appear to be, have been made in the scientific field in terms of attribution science and the knowledge and the wherewithal on the part of people like me, and I'm, I'm generalising, and I'm sure there are barristers and solicitors out there who, who, who are much uh, more au fait with the, the science, but generally the, the legal community and indeed the judges um, that we will be advancing those kind of cases before. So I think there's a real need for that uh, connection to be made and, and uh, you know, uh, an instance, an event like this is, is so important in, in making that connection. Great, thanks Mark. Um, so quite, a, quite an interesting perspective on how the IPCC evidence is really useful and that will be heartening to some of you in the room who produce evidence that's used by the IPCC to see it being used in, in a context you might not have imagined, but also the need for other specific types of evidence. So hmm. I guess good moment to turn to Freddie and tell us a little bit about your experience of evidence that can be useful in these cases. Yeah, and I think uh, M um, Mark is absolutely right that there is a huge disconnect between what we can say scientifically and what is actually being used in the cases. So um, one of my PhD students led a study where we looked at some of the ongoing and past cases um, against fossil fuel companies mainly where it, the cases were about damages arising from uh, the emissions that these companies were responsible for. And all these cases apart from the one that are still ongoing, have failed on, um, on, on standing issues. So the evidence was never really looked at in the courts, but it, that's a good thing because what was pre presented as the evidence was really the extremely outdated and very, very, very far away from what we can actually say in terms of um, scientifically. So on the one hand, there were just, um, there, there was evidence that was just, it was brought against damages that probably have nothing to do with climate change. So where the attribution sort of was perceived or, or assumed, but if you were actually wanting to prove that, you would have had a really hard time, either because it's just one of the kinds of events where climate change does not play a role, or it's something in a region where data is extremely difficult or natural variability is very high. Or, or, or the other cases were where you could have brought this kind of evidence, but um, it was not provided, but it was all, it was just, okay, but we know that climate change is happening, so of course this is because of climate change, in sort of, without actually showing that. So the evidence was, there's much, much more that, that can be done, and I think um, the most important thing is really that there is still a big disconnect between 
what we can know scientifically, so which types of impacts or, or bad things happening are actually because of climate change and which are not. So there's a the big discrepancy in, in understanding between the science community and the general public. And of course, that filters through through lawyers that, that, that there is this disconnect. So one really important thing is really, I think, is just communication and education of what are the realistic impacts and not the ones we would like to be impacts or would like not to be <laughs> impacts. Um, yeah, and I think the other thing is, um, from a more legal point of view, um, that um, to, to establish ways that the IPCC can be used sort of as a, as a causal field, but then you can have individual pieces of evidence yeah. that use methods that have been vetted by the IPCC or so, but where maybe the concrete evidence is not in the IPCC, which I think is something that, um, that can, is actually used in other types of, of causal evidence, but not in climate yet. So that would be a very concrete way of advancing how this stuff could be used. Okay, great. Thanks, Freddie. Really clear. Um, moving on to you, Yuri. I, th I think maybe you're, you could say a little bit about the evidence that you've presented as an expert and, and how you see the opportunity. Yeah, I, first of all, I, I fully agree with the points that, that, that Freddie made on, on, on kind of the, the challenges and the evidence that, that we have available. and. Um, I also want to highlight a bit the, the importance of the IPCC, but also the limitations of the IPCC. The IPCC, the evidence that is often used for, of the IPCC is evidence that is compiled from the existing literature. That means uh, well, scientific literature is there because some researcher at some point posed a question and wrote a paper about it. Um, and, and not all questions have been looked at. And so not all questions are answered by IPCC reports. So while IPCC reports very often on, at the global level provide really good evidence uh, for, for, for local specific cases, um, be, they, be they attribution where Freddie works or carbon budgets that need to be split up to different countries, the IPCC provides little or less guidance uh, or no guidance at all. And, um, and it is for these cases that it's really important that um, the questions that are being, that courts try to answer uh, are also, uh, or scientists are aware of those questions. So they, they, they start pursuing them because very often the scientific insights are even much broader and much, uh, much larger than what is just written up in the literature. Scientists know a lot of stuff that has just not yet been formalized in a study in, uh, in a paper, and well, there's time resources to, <laughs> to, to write this up, so there is a need to focus those, uh, those, those efforts. And um, in that sense, I think uh, knowing which evidence needs there are really can guide this towards a more effective bridging between the science and then the, the application of that evidence in, in litigation. Yeah, okay, great. So it's quite clear there's quite a big opportunity here, quite a lot of gaps, and it's about trying to prioritize which of those gaps we fill in which order to help out the legal community. Um, so now, Margarita. Thank you. Back to, the, back to the legal perspective. What kind of evidence are you hoping there to be more of or would you look for? Yes, perhaps just touching upon a couple of points that were already raised. Um, one, one aspect of work that I've been focusing on quite a bit in the past is the role that judges play in, in the whole movement of climate litigation. And the reason why that's important is that there's quite a degree of nervousness around what role the judiciary can play in this context and also how we can ensure that courts maintain the legitimacy that they have to act objectively and in accordance with the law. And I think evidence really comes in and, and, and plays a really important role here because it's really when you have objective pieces of evidence that are reliable and cogent and coherent and when you present those to the judiciary that there will be less hesitancy on their part uh, to make decisions on climate. Um, and, and certainly in all the conversations I've had, and I'm sure Joanna can, can confirm this, with judges, this tension between we know that we are facing a very sort of urgent crisis and, and that that has to be kept in mind. Uh, this, this concept of climate consciousness, which was coined by a, an Australian judge called uh, Judge Preston, uh, so this tension between this awareness, but also the awareness about the boundaries of, a, of the judge's role 
uh, is very much present in climate litigation. And I really think that the availability of objective and, and cogent evidence can help us overcome those difficulties. So that's the first point that I wanted to make. The second point is in respect to the type of litigation that we've seen. Uh, litigation against uh, public entities and governments is, is very well developed. What we're seeing as well is a massive increase in litigation against a whole new class of private defendants um, and corporate actors. And certainly in the, in the cases that I am involved in, in that context, uh, evidence is really crucial, especially when you're, do, when you're dealing with very complex supply chains, very complex governance structures within those supply chains, and when, we, when you're trying to assess the, uh, the emissions associated to these supply chains, to perhaps assess claims of carbon neutrality or came, claims of carbon negativity, having a good understanding of how you assess the, the emissions of these supply chains. So what approach do you adopt? Is it a cradle to gate? Is it a gate to gate? And all these different scientific co concepts about framing uh, is, is really crucial. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I'll leave you with those two points. Uh, one is the judges and, and two is the corporate actors that we're looking at now. Okay, brilliant, and a nice way to tie that up to evidence. So coming back um, to you, Joanna, um, since you do this review of all kind of litigation going on, what's your feeling about about um, the, the evidence need priorities? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to answer this question with this broad view. And I, I, the first point I would make is that science is present in all litigation. In, and when I say science, I'm thinking natural science or social sciences as well. So that's the first point. And the second is that it's present and necessary to different degrees. Sometimes it's much harder, sometimes it can be easier. So just to give a few examples, in terms of uh, this, uh, when it's not so hard, the science is giving a general validation to the case. So you're bringing a climate case and you want to say that that's, that's an, to convince the judge that this is an important issue, that action needs to be taken now. So you have that type of information available. You go to the IPCC, you know, that's pretty straightforward. It's been said, it has been agreed. Uh, the causes of the problem, who, what are the responsible actors, all of this is pretty much out there. So it's very, um, I would say, easy these days for any litigant bringing a case to make those points. And even easier, because not even, say, the, the, the oil companies challenge the science anymore in litigation. They pretty much accept what's going on. The issue is, okay, they accept that the problem is there. What they usually don't accept is that they have to pay, right? And this is where the specific science is needed. So this is where uh, Freddie and your point comes. You need specific studies to show that exactly how much that person suffered has to do with how much that uh, additional emissions uh, resulted in additional damage. So that's when it starts becoming complicated. So that's the most complicated case, when you go and ask for money and you have to prove uh, the causality. In between, there is a lot of science that is needed. And again, in various degrees. So for example, if you think of the climate washing, green washing claims, you have a company saying, we invest heavily and we are a renewable energy company. And you're talking about an oil company. Well, you know, it doesn't take a lot of effort to show that that company invests no point nor something percent in renewables and therefore, so the science required there is a, a, a pretty basic one to prove that <laughs> there's a greenwashing going on. But then you have more complicated cases, let's say that, uh, for example, the Teotihuacan case, this person who is um, seeking asylum in, uh, from uh, a, an island in Kiribati, seeking asylum in New Zealand and saying that he, he needs to relocate him and his family because of sea level rise. And, and the case actually really uh, was an in interesting one, but one where the both the national government and then ultimately it went to the UN uh, Human Rights Council uh, Committee. Uh, and the understanding was that they hadn't been able to prove that the imminent of the, dam the danger forced them to relocate at that exact time. So uh, slightly different what the national government said and what the UN said, but finally altogether it was about, well, we're talking about something that will happen in 10, 15 years. Your government will take care of what's needed in 10, 15 years. What science do you need to prove that you know, that imminence, that that, that, that uh, person, that individual is suffering? And, and we have many cases like that where 
the science really becomes critical to the case to prove uh, that the emissions of a certain company are so high that they, they might be uh, beyond the national budget. And uh, you, know, you need all the accountancy around that. And all the way to proving the uh, discourse. And this is where historians have been very important too in showing that the, um, the companies have been misleading and creating narratives and lobbying against the science. And again, you need some uh, social science there to show that that discourse has been happening. So uh, just to wrap up, I think my points were, yes, science is absolutely necessary, is natural sciences and social sciences, and they're necessary to different degrees. Okay, brilliant. So you've all managed to make this really come to life, actually. I hope you're all now imagining you want to hear lots more stories about climate litigation cases, because it's, it's really quite fascinating. I want to ask one more question across the whole panel, and then we'll come out to the audience to have a conversation. So we've spoken a bit about the evidence, and in a way, that's the technical side. But Margarita, you brought up this interesting point about the judges. Um, you're both, well, barristers, King's Counsel, and scientists on the panel. <laughs> so there's lots of different kinds of people basically involved in this story. And I'd like to hear from each of you something about that capacity building or the human dimension where you see the opportunities to improve the human capital capacity of this. I mean, Joanna, you also mentioned social sciences. So there's actually a social science dimension to this as well. So if you could each kind of reflect upon someone, some type of person or community that you think um, needs to do a bit of work to have a bigger impact. I'm gonna go a different order. I'm gonna start with Yuri and then, sorry, shock. Not, not at either end of the panel. <laughs> Start with Yuri. Um, we'll do from the scientists first and then go to legal. Well, good. I'll, I'll start reflecting on the scientific community then. Um, many scientists nowadays, uh, particularly environmental scientists, scientists working on, on climate change, want to have a societal impact. And um, the only way of having a societal impact, unless you by accident invent something out of the blue, is, is really to be grounded in society. And, uh, and having, making an impact through climate change litigation means that one needs to be informed about, again, coming back to my pre previous point, uh, the questions that are being asked, the kinds of evidence that is required. Very often, um, the information is there, but simply a reframing or a, a, a different plot can show evidence in a much more compelling, much more understandable and much more usable way. Um, if one is not aware that that kind of presentation is the useful one, one just won't make it, and nobody else will then, after the fact, again make it. So I think there is this, there is this need for, um, for a way to inform scientists, or for scientists to, 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 get in, to, to be informed about what is going on, what is necessary, and, uh, and what is most useful. Okay, perfect, great. Freddie, do you want to build on that a bit again? Um, yeah, I think I would like to, to focus on a, on a different point because one of the important ways of how science gets distributed is via, via the media. And I think this is, um, this is one really important way how also, um, uh, of course, there is the direct uh, informing and, and working with judges and lawyers, but I think there is also a really important uh, step via the media that that science and scientific evidence needs to needs to make because you can't talk to every potential lawyer <laughs> as 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 a, and you can't you can't make that connection um, at least not in a way that every lawyer is aware aware that well, who wants to bring climate litigation or potential plaintiffs of what kind of evidence you could actually bring and you what what is possible to say and what is not possible to say and so I think there's a really important role for scientists to to really whenever when when there are um lit climate litigation cases that are talked about in the media to comment about the evidence to say what what's possible what's not possible to in in situations when it could potentially be relevant for for um for legal cases to to talk about the evidence and and also still i think there is a lot of work to be done to just counteract this picture that the fossil fuel company has very successfully built that all climate science is so uncertain and that it's so different from all other science which of course it's not uncertainty is in every science but i think it's still in a lot of heads that and and and, and i have seen dissertations from lawyers who sort of start by setting out how climate science is so uncertain and why it's therefore so hard 
which I think is, is really the wrong framing. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done to, to on, on the framing, on what we can say, what we can't say, and, 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 um, and I wish scientists, there would be more scientists who would not be so afraid to talk to the, to the media, especially also to talk about things like litigation or something that could be perceived as maybe a little bit political. Okay, brilliant, great. Well, for all imperial scientists in the room, we can give you media training if you want, <laughs> a bit of a plug. <laughs> um, okay, great, two really different perspectives and really helpful there. Um, Joanne, I'm gonna come to you next. What do you think the human capacity dimensions here? Um, I'm not sure uh, if Margarita will continue speaking about the judges. <laughs> I no, go for it. Okay, good, so <laughs> I'll yours. speak about judges. Uh, I, I think it's, it's an important point because we're speaking as, about a small group, you know, with litigants, thousands of litigants around the world, with scientists, many hundreds of thousands, Judges are a small group, so I think I feel it's manageable to think about this group in terms of what they need and what they've been doing, um, and and to help understanding the type of trainings and how they've also been shifting in terms of uh, not wanting to decide on these cases to very much thinking that they you know, this is cases these are cases that they can and sometimes should be deciding on. So my focus will be on the judges. Um, small group, they have the power in their hands because they are brought, a case is brought to them. Of course, the case needs to be good because the judge cannot make the case good. So the case needs to come with evidence. The judge can't create evidence. But considering that the case is good, the evidence is there, then the power is in the hands of the judge. And, and there, I think the judge can do uh, different things if the judge understands how this issue is important and how also this might be an opportunity for broader engagement and uh, awareness in society. And I will give one example of the, how, what happened when uh, the first climate case reached the Supreme Court in Brazil. So the case reaches the Supreme Court. is a case about whether the government had um, paralyzed a, a climate fund. So, you know, it's... Uh, not, not, not the most exciting case in that it's about a fund that had been paralyzed, but what the Supreme Court decided to do was to convene a public hearing where the Supreme Court invites representatives from all of society, from uh, industry, the energy, the agricultural sector, uh, NGOs, indigenous communities, academics, uh, kind of, I think 80 people were called to speak to the Supreme Court and from all their perspectives, the Supreme Court heard what was the problem, what was going on, what are the key issues, and then made a decision, a decision that happened to be very favorable uh, for climate protection and very much against the government, but you know, that's a, a different story. I'm talking about how the, the courts decided to inform themselves. And, 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 and we are still in the stage that I think many courts have that need and that by having that need also they're promoting that conversation within society. So uh, that's one example to all the way to call, uh, judges who call one individual scientist to provide expert opinion and, and, and inform themselves. So I think there are many things that the judges can do. The last example is judges who decided to uh, get out there themselves, in the case of Saul Luciano Luia versus RWE, the well-known case in Peru, where the judges effectively traveled all the way from Germany to Peru to f deal with uh, the issues with the height and uh, not sure how much coke they had to take, the <laughs> coke leaves, uh, to, to manage uh, the, the, the high altitude. But effectively, they were there to experience, to understand what Saul Luciano was saying about the village being in danger. And as far as I can tell, the experience of being there was very important for the judges. So you see, judges can uh, participate in this in, very, uh, in, in, in the climate case in very different ways if they are open to uh, learning and understanding more. Okay, brilliant. Um, now over to the legal side. Mark, wh where do you see the capacity for <clears throat> opportunities? Well, well um, I was going to talk about a hypothetical judge, but um, I've been, I think, mm -hmm. let off the hook because I echo everything that uh, Joanna has said about um, the need to get judges' um, climate consciousness raised and the ways in which they can be done. Uh, I mean, there was an example in the US in the uh, Our Children's Trust case where the judge held a tutorial in court and listened to the experts and, and got, you know, raised 
I think it was a he, but the, the, the awareness of the judge in that context, and that might be a way forward too for some of our judges. Uh, but I don't have to think about a particular judge, and I don't, and, and that, 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 that's good, because I'm going to talk instead briefly about barristers and solicitors, lawyers, particularly in the UK. Um, we need, I think, to collaborate, as we're doing today, but, but, but on a more regular basis with the scien scientist. And, um, and, and having understood much more about the advances that they've made, um, get that message out um, in articles, in, journal, in, in journals, in the kind of the legal media, if I can call it space, if I can call it that. And, and, and once that message is out, it can, can be conveyed to the NGOs, and indeed the NGOs will read those, uh, uh, those journals too, and, and also those on the ground. And, and, and then people will start to think, well, hang on, um, I live on the edge of a cliff, and um, it's not my fault that that, uh, that that cliff is collapsing into the sea. It's as a consequence of sea rises, and there are uh, uh, companies, fossil fuel companies and the like, out there that are responsible for continuing uh, that uh, uh, impact on my home, my family life, and, and um, perhaps should be held responsible. The, the, the problem I can foresee, though, in terms of those cases, and I, I didn't touch on this, but I'm going back to it, is that the cost of the, um, uh, the scientific evidence in an individual case may be um, excessive in terms of the uh, uh, financial wherewithal of the individual. So um, individual cases brought by individuals who are suffering from climate change may be difficult if there isn't a bank of evidence, scientific evidence, covering you, you know, not just regions but smaller localities. Um, and I'd like to see that advance being made, if at all possible, so that that evidence is accessible and affordable. Okay, okay. brilliant, great. And then Margarita, coming to you at the end. Yeah. I hope all the ideas aren't exhausted. Yeah, so three very quick point, points. One hinges very much on what Freddie was saying earlier. Um, one particular feature, and Joanna touched upon this al already, about climate litigation is its strategic nature. And in order to be strategic, you have to co cooperate with wider civil society. You need to be in touch with journalists, with people, with artists, with students. You need to be in touch with communities who can then pick up the learnings from the litigation and actually use them to make a wider impact. And that's the whole point about trying to bring strategic cases. So it's not just about winning that case, it's about if we win this case, what kind of ripple effect can we have and how can we have it? And certainly the societal element to that is crucial. Um, the second point is, um, about a concept uh, which Joanna writes about in her report, which was sent around earlier. Um, it, it's this concept of movement uh, lawyering, and it's very much used by a number of NGOs, and I think in particular about natural justice, which is an NGO that works predominantly in Africa. And I'll just, I just want to tell a story about that case, about, about one case that they supported um, to protect uh, Lamu, which is a protected area in Kenya. And the point about uh, that case is that they, they worked with a community uh, in Lamo very extensively before bringing the case. And the importance about doing that is that often once you win a case, it's not really the end of the story. You need to think about how does, how does this case get enforced. And the only way in which you do that is if you have informed, empowered communities who are aware and understanding about the legal claim and also agents in that legal claim. So it's moving away from this idea of you sort of hand the case to the lawyer, the lawyer does his, jo does his job and then turns away and walks away. That really doesn't work in a lot of cases that involve climate. Um, and then the final point that I wanted to, uh, to, to mention, because it hasn't been raised yet, is the role that youth is playing in the climate litigation movement, because it is a defining feature of what we're seeing. You have children who are active on the street and they are becoming increasingly more active in the courts. Uh, and really this engagement with, with, with young people uh, is, is, I think, fundamental uh, to, to, to climate litigation as a whole. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you. Lots and lots of food for thought there. Um, very engaging. So this is a moment where we're going to open it out to questions or comments from the floor to continue the conversation. Um, good, hands are up already. Before I choose people in the room, there was one question online. We've had about six or seven online. Um, that was directly relevant to what you were just saying, Margarita. So I'm going to just go back to that and then pick up on the questions in the room. Someone asked specifically, because we were talking about the different kinds of actors involved, about activists, and you finished there with youth. Could you expand a bit more on activists in general? Um, are activists generally the plaintiffs in these claims? What's, what's the role of the activist community here? Or should that, should that be changing in the future? 
Well, I, I'm, I'm referring back again to something that Joanna wrote, so I don't know if, if I can then oh, hand yes. the question over to her. But I thought one really interesting thing that Joanna and, and Kate Hyam say in their latest uh, climate litigation snapshot report is this idea of movements. And so the idea that climate litigation, or perhaps you said this at the launch event, but the idea that one, one aspect of climate litigation, if there's a group of activists that succeeds in one case, that tends to inspire different groups of activists that tend to be very well connected. And I think we're starting to see it in the legal community certainly because we're trying to really reach out and make those connections not not just amongst lawyers but amongst sort of the the, the activists who are interesting interested in bringing forward litigation I think this connectivity is really fundamental but I don't know if Joanna you have anything to add on that um, uh, you, you spoke very well I would add just one point in terms of the youth uh, to note that it, the youth movement was very strong in until 2019 and, and going to the streets COVID hit, and uh, of course, they were not able to go to the streets and strike in the same way they were before. And, and, and I wanted to point that quite a few of those uh, youth leaders that were leading the, the Friday strikes, for example, then ended up getting involved in litigation. I don't know if people know that, but for example, of course, um, uh, so Luisa Neubauer in Germany, and, and Freddie and I had the chance to, to be with her in the panel, and, and she talks about how she understands that there is a role in going to court, and uh, and Greta Thunberg as well. So many of these youth uh, activists have also understood that they have they can play a role in courts. So just adding that when, when these two things uh, intersect. Can I just perhaps just add one point that came to mind? Um, another really interesting point about activists is uh, the criminal scenario, because what we've seen is activists who are essentially strategizing to be arrested. And if you've gone to any sort of Extinction Rebellion meeting, uh, you know that uh, they, they do sort of trainings on how do you get arrested? How do you not get arrested if you don't want to get arrested? But they really have a strategy where they want to flood the courts, the criminal courts, with arguments on necessity. So essentially saying this kind of criminal conduct uh, is, is lawful, actually, because it's necessary in the face of the climate crisis. And I think that's another really interesting angle on the activism side. Um, you preempted another question of mine. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come to you in a second, which was about the kind of scientific evidence that might be required in that kind of a case. So if there's an activist being in court, being accused of disrupting something, and they've been doing it for climate reasons, have you, have you ever been asked to give evidence in that kind of case? Could you see a role that scientific evidence could be used to defend the actions of that person in a criminal court? I, I can definitely see a role of scientific evidence being used. The challenge is that it's a bit the same challenge that there is in the international climate negotiations. Uh, science can tell you what the implications are, what the risks are at 1.5 to uh, today's levels of warming. Um, science doesn't say whether this is dangerous, acceptable, uh, that, that's a value judgment. I mean, that's why you are in court. And so uh, science can provide these pieces of information, but then yeah, the, the value judgment uh, is, uh, is one where science, where, where science ends and, and, and lawyers and society take over. And I guess this falls a bit foul of what you were mentioning before, Mark, that in these individual cases, the cost of that scientific evidence to defend each of the individual activists might become astronomical. Yeah, I, I think um, in the case where uh, perhaps I was def defending myself for uh, protest and I wanted to uh, claim a defence of necessity, I would pray and aid the IPCC reports, uh, uh, you know, again, in, in controversial evidence. And I would say that um, the imminence of the, of, of the danger, as it were, um, it is, is present because although a lot of the youth cases, the intergenerational claims are, are, are quite, quite properly looking at the future, um, the reality is that if we, if we cross tipping points, then there's no way back. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, um, we don't know when we're going to cross those tipping points. And so that, I think, feeds into a defence of necessity. Okay, great. Now we're going to come to the room. So, a couple of hands up, we're up straight away, so not right in the front, we're there, but with a bluish shirt, yeah. 
Okay, so I'm gonna to have to repeat these questions so that people in line can hear them. So let's see if I understood. Um, so there's a difference um, across jurisdictions, but also in some cases between science and law on the standards of evidence and the burden of proof required. Um, and that might limit either scientists' comfort to present their evidence or even scientific publishability to even talk about that versus what might be the range required in court for a decision. Um, do we see that changing? How does that affect court decisions in different jurisdictions and so on? So really interesting question. I'm gonna ask you, Mark, first of all, if you see that playing Thank out you. in court, <laughs> and then I'm gonna turn to you, Freddie, to talk about how that might affect the evidence. I mean, the first thing to say is that the burden of proof is uh, generally on the claimant bringing the case. Um, the standards in the UK is um, the civil standard, which is um, that it's more likely than not, more probable than not. So it's actually 51%. If you can get past the 51%, then you, you, you're, you're pretty much home and dry. Um, but the, in terms of the evidence and the certainty or um, you know, uncertainty of the scientific evidence you might be relying upon, and, and we've heard what Freddie said about the fact that it's much more certain than perhaps people give it credit. Um, <clears throat> again, it's about uh, convincing the judge, um, or perhaps in a, a jurisdiction where there's a jury, the judge and the jury, um, that it's more likely than not um, that the, uh, uh, the impacts that are described by the scientists will occur uh, as a consequence of um, either the act or the wrongdoing of the individual uh, defendant or, 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 or collective of defendants um, or, or, or um, that they have contributed to the impact that is uh, uh, alleged to have occurred um, or to have been experienced by the claimant. So, you know, that evidence um, needs to be of a, a sufficient weight. It needs to be credible, coherent. It needs to be readily digestible by the, a judge. You know, that's another thing about scientific evidence. Um, if you're not a scientist, you need to be able to understand it, whether that be the lawyer, um, the member of the jury, or the judge. Um, and, and so, you know, I'd urge scientists, albeit not to undermine their, their own credibility and indeed the, the, the research they do, but to ensure that it's readily digestible, um, it, it, perhaps with a summary um, explaining, you know, all the relevant terms and all the relevant uh, uh, underlying uh, principles. Uh, but if that evidence is coherent, and, 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 and plausible, um, and isn't undermined by the defence cross-examining it um, uh, uh, so that it, um, it no longer seems to bear the weight it ought to, then uh, providing the, the judge is satisfied on the civil standards uh, that it's more likely than not that that evidence uh, uh, should be accepted, um, then you know, providing other elements have been satisfied, the, 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 the damage is not too remote and there are other tests that sometimes apply, then um, the claim may well be successful. Okay, great. And um, Margarita, before I come to Freddie, any, any thoughts on the international dimension? I don't know which of you do more international law. Um, that's, that was a UK kind yeah. of more likely than not. Is that, is that same in different other jurisdictions that you may have worked in? Not, I haven't really done work in other jurisdictions. The only thing I can think about is um, sort of the slight difference that you have between common law and civil law jurisdictions. And in civil law jurisdictions, the judges have a, a more active investigatory role. Um, and, and just sort of popped to mind as to... Uh, whether there'd be any difference there, but unfortunately I don't have. I'll leave, it that, I'll leave that as a question. And then another, um, another issue that I've come across is, say that you have two different scientific, I think we've discussed this already, you have two different experts uh, who are on the opposite sides of the case that might create additional complications when, you're, when you, you might cross-examine both and the judge might find both, both of their evidence relatively cre credible. Uh, so at that point, that's where the value judgments mm. come in. And so again, I think there's always a bit of a, of a relationship between evidence and, and assessment by the judiciary. Okay, brilliant. So coming over to you, Freddie, there's a question there that also related to when you publish scientific evidence, you need certain certainty that might be different than, than, than what Mark just described. Yeah, and I think this, this is really, this is really the, 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 the big difference is that when you, when you publish scientific work, you sort of you quantify your uncertainty in, in some ways. Um, but you never, um, 
sort of, but but this is obviously in the framework of the data and the methods you have you have used, and you don't say, you don't answer the question: Is this more likely than not? That's not usually how you present scientific scientific evidence in in a scientific paper, and so I think this is. Um, this is why this has been so comp so difficult because it's just very different languages, very different ways of, of dealing. And this is um, where I think um, to bring these to bring these because in every you can always poke holes in an individual scientific paper if you if you want to. There's always you never have the perfect model or, or there's there are there are better and poorer papers. So sometimes it's very easy. Sometimes you have to do a bit harder work, but I think for an individual paper, you will always find ways to attack it. So I think if you, if you, if you want to, I think this idea to examine a case based on two individual pieces of evidence just doesn't, that's not how science work, and then you end up with a battle of experts. But in order for the, the judge then to make a normative or value-based judgment that is, that is based on anything more than their own values what you need to have is this what i said what i called earlier is this causal field so you can often when you look at a paper at a, at a piece of evidence from a scientific point of view you can see is it sort of the methods that are usually used to do this have they done due diligence with testing their models and in a way that that is sort of how, for example, in the IPCC chapter, you describe this is how you do model evaluation. So then you can say that this individual piece of evidence for a specific case fits with the causal field, while the other one does not, because they have just looked at the last 10 years of the time series, because that was making their point or something. But, but, but I think in, it's, it's work to get to that, to equip judges to be able to make that. But it's not impossible. But this is really where the... Um, where the sort of the, the communication the, all, and, and, and the training becomes really crucial. Okay, brilliant, thanks. And I'm just gonna take another question online which is related to this evidence. Um, you both spoke then also about different pieces of evidence um, being presented. Um, someone online has asked, what about scientific updates? Um, so if things get updated after the event, I guess there's a, a legal dimension to this because I guess it must happen all the time hmm. that evidence becomes apparent after or during maybe a legal case. Um, but also maybe, um, Yuri or Freddie, you have thoughts on the changing, changing body of evidence. Maybe Mark? Well, um, it's, it's so important, obviously, to have up-to-date evidence, um, uh, up-to-date scientific evidence. And in, in two cases that I've um, looked at very recently, um, Marguerite's involved in one of them, the Agostino case, um, but also the Swiss senior women uh, case before the European Court of Human Rights. Both have been referred to the Grand Chamber, as you may know. Um, they, have, uh, they were issued uh, perhaps now a couple of years ago, 18 months, two years ago. And, and we've had the uh, IPCC AR6 report um, updating the science. And even that now is perhaps out of date. But, but, but the point is that the parties, the, um, the applicants in both cases, have been updating the court as, as they've been making further representations, observations on government submissions and the like. Uh, and um, you know, I think it's, cru it's crucial that when it comes to the determination of admissibility and the merits um, in, in those cases, that the court is looking at the up-to-date scientific position. Great, and, and maybe Yuri, you can say something about the, how science changes, updates. Yes, science uh, continues to, to investigate and, 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 and develop further uh, understanding of our world, but I want to highlight, for example, here the IPCC and, and the work that they are doing, where um, certain statements, a certain level of confidence is attached to certain statements. The IPCC makes statements uh, ideally with high confidence, but if not with medium or with low confidence, and that confidence that um, that uh, depends on the amount of evidence that is available, the diversity of evidence that is available, what the IPCC refers to as different lines of evidence. For example, how many papers are there? How many different methods are there? With how many different methods has one looked at this problem? From how many different disciplines do we understand the same thing? And if, and if, if their same insight is, can be drawn from a large body of literature, from several different disciplines, the, the confidence is very high and it's very 
it, it's, it's, it's unlikely, not in a probabilistic sense, but it, it is just not very plausible that one single study will overturn this. So then scientific advance will just build on this and provide new information. Um, so we, we have to take into account that scientific statements can make, be made with different levels of confidence, and, and the IPCC does this in a very good way. In, in other cases, of course, there is, there, is, there is data that every year is, is updated. Um, I think there it is important that it is updated according to standardized methods, uh, the temperature record, the annual emissions, uh, and so on. Um, but that kind of information also, again, just adds to the body of, of knowledge and the body of evidence that can support the case that it would never overturn uh, the, uh, the, the current understanding as it is communicated by the IPCC. Okay, great. That's a really good way to paint the evidence landscape and the things that can be added to it. All right, back to questions in the room. Um, up there. All right. So, um, I think this uh, Okay, great. So that comment from the floor was about the important role that Parliament plays, which I haven't mentioned yet, in laying down the laws, which <coughs> it's the role of the judiciary to interpret, um, and those are often presented in policies, and what's the interplay between those and the kind of um, issues we're discussing here. I'm going to first ask Joanna maybe to say something about that, um, and then maybe Margarita wants to say something. Sure. Uh, it's a very important point that we hadn't raised, but uh, having laws is, is, I would say, the first very important step everywhere. Because, first of all, if ideally a law will avoid a litigation, because uh, you would avoid, for example, litigation probably in the US, where they're asking for some guidance. Uh, in many of the cases. So it can avoid litigation because it provides the, the guidelines, the, the vision, the targets, the institutions, the funding. The, uh, legislation can establish all of those actions that then uh, result in different policies. And uh, legislation, if you're thinking about the higher level legislation, the constitution, for example, can set uh, the, the most important rights that are going to be protected in society. For example, a constitution can recognize the right to a healthy environment. So wherever you have those pieces, it becomes much easier to make, to defend, for example, um, not expanding uh, oil and gas in a country if you, can, if you already have the targets in the legislation and you have the protection of the environment in the constitution. So all of those uh, make it easier to protect individual and, 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 and the uh, general rights. So th that's, that's the first. And then, of course, uh, still, that, that doesn't preclude litigation because there are issues that are going to be challenged against that, that uh, legislation. But again, it becomes easier for, for the judge to decide if th those are there. So I think that's my quick answer to your important question. Great, excellent. Any, any thoughts on your side, Margarita? Just really briefly, I, again, I think it was a really good point and, and another um, issue that, that, that you come across when you're looking at laws. I mean, the first, as Joanna was saying, first question is, is there a law that, that we can rely on? The second question is, what does that law actually say? And one, one example that I've recently been working on includes two pieces of legislation here in the UK. One is the Animal Sentience Act and the other one is the well-known well Climate Change Act. And I'll just give an example of the difference in the obligations that those acts establish. So under the Climate Change Act, the Secretary of State has to lay a, a report before Parliament showing how uh, the policies that it sets for, forth will enable carbon budgets to be met. So that, that obligation is a bit more substantive because there's a requirement to show that you're actually doing something which will allow the carbon budgets to be met. If you look at the Animal Sentience Act, the, the content of the obligation is much more watered down. It's essentially if, if the committee that is established under that act 
raises concerns about a piece of law or, poli or a piece of law or policy that that might harm um, animals or wildlife, etc. Uh, then the Secretary of State just has to re respond by putting a report before Parliament, but that there's no further specification about what that report should or should not include. So I think really the nature of obligations under different statutes is really important because you can all, you, the, the stronger those obligations are, the, the easier it is to latch upon them to bring claims. So, so yes, certainly trying to get more biting legislation, I think, is, is, is a crucial part of the picture. Okay, brilliant. Back to the floor. Um, there, hold on. So going to repeat that question for the audience online. Um, looking a little bit back to this discussion we were having about evidence and the gap that Yuri presented between the IPCC evidence, which is incontrovertible, as, as Mark said, particularly in courts, is rarely challenged, um, but is more general, and the more specific information we need, particularly around two areas in mitigation-related cases, the first being actual local impacts, often in the global south, so often really unexplored, um, and also talking about the, the actual responsibility, how far is the fair share um, part of a mitigation plan or policy by government um, and you know asking the panel to reflect a little bit on on the relative importance of these two types of, of data or evidence that which is really broad but hard to challenge and that that's really really specific and could enter one of these battles um, maybe Freddie you can go first yeah I think I think what what is what what it really comes down to is is methods and I think there's a huge discrepancy that we have between mitigation and adaptation loss and damage. So there is a task force on, on metrics in the IPCC on how to measure emissions and, and so on. So, um, and and there is, there's a huge amount of not specific evidence, but at least of specific methods and metrics that you can use to provide that evidence. So in that case, you can go away and produce that evidence in a specific case. Whereas on the adaptation side, we do not have an inventory on the impacts of climate change. We don't have a definition of what loss and damage is. We don't have a accepted method on how to, how to quantify impacts of climate change. And that's a real problem. And that is why in these kind of cases, the evidence in courts at the moment is super wishy-washy because, well, if you don't, it, there, there is no, at least no, so there is sort of with the attribution, there's sort of an emerging sort of method of, of how you can do this, but 
there is nothing that is comparable to, to, to the metrics and inventory standards that you have on the mitigation side. And I think this is where, where the legislation actually becomes really important and, and a really important point. Because if you, you could say, you could task the IPCC, can you do a task force on how to measure impacts? It would be possible. We actually have all the tools and there would still, of course, it would not be comprehensive, but it would be a possible thing to do. We could say, okay, we want a global inventory on the impacts of climate change. It would not be comprehensive, but we could at least lay down what are the methods to, to get this, and that, that would make a huge difference. But at the moment, we don't have that. So I think there is still there's this big piece of work to do from the science to the actually law makers or, or, or policy bodies to, to, to even this adaptation loss and damage versus mitigation out a bit in terms of available evidence and metrics and standards. Okay, great. Thanks, Freddie. And, and, and Joanna, you've mentioned the importance of social science before. Does social science have a, have a potential role to play on the fair share part of this discussion? Um, yeah, definitely. Well, the, uh, even if you look at the, the research that has been produced so far on fair shares, it has been a collaboration between lawyers and economists and people who the account wherever for emissions. So it, you definitely need that combination of expertise to understand uh, what, uh, what are the principles uh, of equity, for example, and how that, those translate into the fair shares. So that has been an area that uh, very much also, I would say, the, some cases needed that, but some cases generated that need. So the Urhenda case generated a, a, a new wave of scholarship even to try to understand that. So there's that mutual cycle. Sometimes we think that uh, schol legal scholars are only waiting for new cases to write about, but sometimes you see also how uh, uh, research can motivate a case and you know you have this reinforcing. So I, th I think specifically in this area of fair share, there has been this really uh, fruitful collaboration between uh, those bringing cases and those thinking about these issues and, 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 and helping to explain to judges how to figure that exactly because this, uh, there, there wasn't a formula, there wasn't an answer already there. So that, that had to be built. So to, to tell a government you have to reduce by X, Y, well, why that had to be built and it's being built. Okay, great. Um, there are so many questions, can I just say? Can like, I say hold this yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, after Mark speaks, I'm gonna take one more question from the audience. Um, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, just in case uh, anybody doesn't know, there's a great paper on fair share by uh, Lavanya Rajamani and others. That's the one I was... Thinking. Yeah, and um, <laughs> I mean, that, that explore, explores from the legal perspective, um, you, you know, the international norms that perhaps ought to be applied by decision makers like the European Court of Human Rights in the forthcoming cases. Um, um, those international norms that ought to govern the question of whether or not uh, a, a particular country... Uh, is doing its fair share. I mean, the reality is none of them are, but um, but that's the uh, paper that's worth looking at. Brilliant, thanks. Okay, one more question in the room. Take that one at the back there. Uh, it's kind of two questions, but they uh, Then ask them as if they're one. <laughs> Okay, so two questions there, but I'm going to rephrase them a little bit. But the question from the floor was one about a recent KLM case of litigation um, about the veracity or otherwise of their offsets that they were using, which I think probably falls into the category of the greenwashing type stuff that you mentioned, Joanna. And the second was to what extent um, do we think litigation will drive, you gave the example of a carbon tax. I'm going to reframe the second question because there's also been a similar question online, which is will climate litigation succeed where economists have failed? Um, I think that's maybe a bit harsh. 
um, <laughs> economists. It, it wasn't posed like this online, by the way, um, but that's a summary of it, which is, you know, we've had some decades in Stern Review in particular in the UK that where economists um, and the way that economists look at the issue of climate change has really driven a lot of action um, on climate. And now climate litigation is perhaps a different way of looking at the issues. And might that take us a lot further, including taking us further um, on, on policy. Um, so but I'm going to start with a very particularly, do one of the two of you want to take a comment on, the, on that legal case with, with KLM? I don't know enough about the, the, the case. I know of it, but I, I, I couldn't comment. Um, Joanna may know a little bit more about it. Um, yeah, I can give some general comments, but uh, specifically addressing to your question. So this is a, a case uh, filed by Planet Earth against KLM, challenging the uh, offsetting and saying that you know, what they say that they are going to reduce is not proven. And uh, the case is also a case about climate greenwashing. I think what's interesting about this case is that it's going to be probably the first of many of such cases, because the more you have companies, sometimes well intended, but sometimes still very vague about what they, uh, how they want to, to reduce uh, their emissions, uh, and, and you have litigation being used as a form to uh, bring accountability, uh, then you know, when you bring these two things together, really it becomes harder to, to make, uh, to commit to things that you can't deliver th that don't exist yet there, which is very much the point. I think this also links to uh, bringing back the discussion to the science. It's also important how, uh, for example, in cases against governments, how governments would talk about negative emissions. And this is where we also need science to say, well, so the judge will be faced with that. Ju the judge doesn't know if that's feasible, plausible, and this is where science will have to say, well, yeah, we would all want that, but that's something we're thinking of in many years down the line. It's not something that can be promised now. So the, the, the lawyers, the judges won't have that answer, and, and this is, again, another area for science to help with litigation. And, and, and just briefly on the will litigation succeed where economists failed. I, I don't want to say that it's <laughs> one against the other. Uh, the fact is that uh, many economists have uh, been saying that they have high hopes on litigation, which is, uh, I guess, an interesting point in itself. I, I always refer to this time when Jeffrey Sachs came to the LSE, and I, I thought his theory of justice was going to be a, a, an economic theory of justice. And his theories of justice was sue everyone. <laughs> like, wow, okay, that's uh, <laughs> quite bold. So, you know, you, you get the, the economists really tired and the science tired of talking, talking, and, and uh, this is why Yuri and, and Freddie are engaging with the lawyers. It's not that you know, lawyers are super cool people, it's that there's some hope, no, we are, uh, but, <laughs> but there's hope that uh, the lawyers can do something where the, the, they couldn't get so far. So there's, I wouldn't say it's one instead of the other, but it's one contributing with the other. Okay, brilliant. I'm going to take it down the line here. I know there's something you want to say um, on, the, on the potential you see for climate litigation going forward. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, scientists are getting bored of, 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 of explaining to us the dangers associated with climate change, which is why they're sticking themselves to buildings and campaigning and protesting um, just as others are. Um, I think that uh, this question about the carbon tax and the question of whether or not climate change litigation will succeed where perhaps economists have failed, is, from, a, from a lawyer's perspective, you might understand, I'd say, I think it's likely that we will, uh, by taking particularly the fossil fuel companies to court, um, hitting their, um, their finances, um, you know, shareholder actions and the like, hitting the World Bank, perhaps, um, other international financial uh, uh, institutions. Um, those that are currently ex saying one thing um, about you know, the, their, their investments, but in fact, enormous investment going in from these you know, international financial associations um, into fossil fuel uh, development. You know, we need to tackle that. And when we start tackling, the, you know, as it were, the head, um, uh, uh, the higher echelons, um, then I think that there, there will be, and this is a trickle-down economics point, but uh, we will find that, it, that eventually um, that we may uh, succeed. That was very good diplomatic. You used trickle-down economics to demonstrate how law will win <laughs> Which the Which I don't believe day. in, by the way. <laughs> um, 
I, I, we're just going to take two more minutes of your time. I know we're, we're going slightly over, but if, if each of you can just give a quick comment on um, either climate versus um, litigation versus economics or just how you see this developing. Well, I think, um, I, I think very much the same, that it's not, climate litigation will not solve all the problems that we have not solved in, in politics because, well, the, sometimes it, you also need some laws first that you can apply or interpret. Um, but I think it, it can very much, I think it's a very, um, it's, a, it's a very good way to also put, I, I think, a bit lens on, uh, because when you, when you have a concrete mm. case, you actually have to look at how all the different drivers of whatever happens come together. And I think that is something that we often really, really miss in, in, the, in the, polit the political discussion, but also in the, in the science where it's still very much, oh, I look at the climate variables in my model because I know how to get them out of there. And then some social scientists might look at, oh, we look at the vulnerability and the people who are affected because that's most important. But when you have a case, you need to look at how all these things come together. And it actually, I think, really forces more interdisciplinary science and more interdisciplinary work. And actually, it forces scientists to deal with the real world, which we often don't really like to do, because then we can be proven wrong. Whereas when you stick in your, in your theories, then, then everything's fine. So I think, I think there, climate litigation can be really powerful and much more strategic than just um, getting fossil fuels companies to change their business model, which is also in, in, on a different level strategic and probably important. But I think just it, it forces society to think about these problems in a more interconnected way. And I think that is where it's really powerful, completely independent of, of, of specific cases. Okay, brilliant. Yuri. Um, yeah, to come to the question of whether clim I see climate litigation playing a, a role and, and, and changing things where, where the econo economists have failed. Um, Actually, I, 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 do, I, I do see uh, climate litigation play an important role. And, and, and the key reason for that is that um, when thinking about the risks that, that, that businesses are, are, are faced with, um, there are kind of three risks. There's the, the transition risk, how, how, how quickly become fossil fuel assets become uh, uh, invaluable. Uh, then the physical risks of climate impacts. Uh, both of them, however, are strongly linked to discount rates that businesses are using. The third risk that businesses are faced with is litigation risk. And that is the one risk where a longer term vision can be used, a lower social discount rate, a, 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 a longer future vision. And so I think that this provides a key additional perspective to the risks that, that businesses need to be taken into account when, uh, when making their plans for the future. Okay, great. And, and We'll leave with a lawyer to say whether yeah. lawyers are, are going to um, do better than economists. Yeah, I really don't have too much to add to what's already been said, but um, on the sort of offsetting question in particular, I think really the, the, the point is that litigation cannot be seen in isolation. So if you, if you think of net zero, it's a concept on which we have very little agreement or consensus about exactly what it means, how you use offsets there, and the concept of fair share. And, and there's very little regulation on that. And, and so especially when you're looking at corporate actors, it's quite difficult to go after them uh, unless you have that pre-existing regulation that provides clarity and provides definitions about what should and should not be done. So, so I always think it's it's important to think that litigation is is a tool, but it's not the only one. And related to that, it often happens to me and, and colleagues that, that you have very well-meaning um, people coming to you and sort of saying, oh, this is, this is a big problem. What's the legal solution to it? And the difficulty you face when that happens is that you need to, cases need to fit into very stringent legal boxes and very stringent causes of actions. And they're not usually the solution for any abstract problem related to the climate. Uh, there, it always has to be wedded in, in what the law says and, and what kind of regulations we can apply. Um, so just to leave it on that point, perhaps that law is not the certainly not the only and certainly not the sole answer to all our problems, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Um, so before we wrap up, and I'm sorry, we've gone over by a few minutes, we're going to go back to the Menti, uh, the Menti quiz. If you can go back on your phones or devices um, and just uh, get a feel for how much you feel you know now and your thoughts about the role of climate litigation yourself in the room. So I'll give you a minute to do that. 
it still looks very intense, intent and intense. It's like being in an exam room. Okay, maybe Hannah, you can, you can pop the results up. You can keep typing. I think it just does it live. Okay, so um, most people in the middle there, um, the, the, uh, how valuable science is in litigation cases. Um, science has a big impact, um, other factors involved. Um, a few people thinking that science is detrimental to the outcome of a case. We don't even have time to explore that now. Um, and after listening to everyone's input on climate litigation, um, what should we focus on next? I'm gonna stand up, because I can't, I can't read this here, but a few, a few things. Um, really hard to say. Disaggregated data, <laughs> um, regional impacts, bringing other stakeholders, a lot of people spoke about that communication, informing the lawyers and the judiciary, um, hitting fossil fuel interests, so that's very uh, mission orientated, um, and a range of other ways that we can use climate litigation. So please continue to contribute, whether you're here in the room, we'll pick up on those because we are actively going to be discussing amongst ourselves what we do next, so you can help determine our agenda and our work to some extent. Um, thank you all um, on the panel for participating in a really wide-ranging conversation. I really think we covered a lot. Um, apologies to you and the audience who had questions to ask that we didn't get the chance to discuss. There were really a large number of questions, both online and in the room. Um, if you do have further questions, um, you know how to reach um, us, at least at the Grantham Institute, and we can see what we can do with those questions um, to get more information out. I'm not promising to answer every question I receive in, in due course. But anyway, um, do reach out to us um, and let us know how you found the event. Um, thank you again, Joanna, Mark, Freddie, Yuri, and Margarita for coming along. And thank you all for taking the time to join us. Thank you, Andy. Thank you.